Hey guys, just a quick little video today. Let me move that better. There you go. Um, quick little video today about uh, low voltage wiring. I show you how I wire all my gas furnaces, heat pumps, ACs, uh, dual fuel systems. And then uh, I start off the video with uh, showing you guys how I do my sales, uh, sales costing, how I, how I bid out my jobs, and some things you want to look for in that. And uh, I'm happy to give you guys more tips personally if you need it. Uh, you can always find my phone number. Uh, my business is on my shirt here. I know it's backwards, but it's seat and heating and AC. Feel free to call me at any time if you guys uh, are starting up an HVAC business and you need any, uh, tips and tricks or anything on uh, how to do it. Like I said, I started with $200 to my name, so um, and I made it work uh, successfully. So enjoy today's videos. And uh, like I said, next week I'll be back with the ride-along videos. And uh, I look forward to those because uh, that's my bread and butter, and I, uh, I really enjoy doing those. So uh, that'll be next week. So enjoy this one, though. Okay, guys, just a quick little video on um, how I price my work and some things you want to think about when you're pricing your um, HVAC projects, whether it be install or service repair. So number one, going rate right in your area. And uh, that's kind of a touchy subject, I know, but we're going to go over that. Uh, number two, cost of doing business. You need to know what your break-even costs are, so you and know what your overhead is, so you know that uh, you know you're going to make the profit that you need to to stay in business. And then three is how busy are you? So there's a couple different things, uh, ways I go about it, uh, as far as uh, how I price my work, depending on my workload. Uh, I, I do have a I do have a different uh, divisor that I use for when I am busier. So let's. Uh, Let's go over these three things. All right, guys. So going rate is basically, you know, if you if you're working in an area long enough, you uh, you know what what your competitors' prices prices are, especially on like a simple AC change out or a gas furnace jaw uh, change out or heat pump, etc. So what I like to do is, you know, I I note I note what their prices are. I ask the customers, you know, hey, can I take a look at the cut at the at my competitors' bids? And most people are happy to do that as long as they know you're not you're not using that to try to try to underbid them. Which I I don't try to do that. I try to fall somewhere in the middle. So uh, that being said, you know, you get a feel, um, especially if you've, been in, if you've been in an area for more than a few years, what what your uh, competitors' prices are. Now, I know going rate's not something that you should base your prices on, but it does give you uh, an idea of, you know, if you're going to be anywhere near uh, getting that project. So, uh, let's move on to uh, number two. Okay, guys, number two, cost of doing business, or, yeah, cost of doing business. Sorry, I, I thought I was on number one still. Uh, so, cost of doing business. What is your... Uh, what are your fixed costs? What it, what are your variable costs? So you definitely want to know what your fixed costs are. What I recommend you do is you uh, sit down with either your accountant or if you're do it yourself like me, uh, take your yearly costs and divide them by three hundred or however, however many working days you ha you have, not three hundred sixty five, but divide divide your yearly cost. Um, and if you've been in business like me for for many years, you can average out your you know like ten years, five years. And then you can, um, you know, average out what that is for, per year, divide it by however many working days you have per year, 200, 250, whatever it may be. And that'll give you your daily break even. Once you know your break even, then you can start figuring out, okay, what, pro what, what profit do I want to make? And you can add a percentage to that. You know, what do I want to pay myself? What do I want to pay my secretary if you have one? What do I want to pay my guys? And, uh, you know, see what, see what works for you. But you got to know all those costs, uh, firsthand or you're just kind of uh you know throwing darts at a dartboard which you never want to do so find out uh find out your uh your break even point first that is number one guys that's totally number one as soon as you know that you're in good shape so uh, i know exactly what i need to make every day on average um to break even which is very important so uh, let's move on to number three okay guys number three so uh i'm going to go over to the uh the whiteboard I'm going to show you how I how I do how I do this how I price my my install projects and these are going to be just uh, random numbers but this is how I do it as far as formula wise and uh, let me show you okay guys I'm gonna break this down very simple for you so I use a divisor to price my work okay 
It's real simple. If I'm busy, I divide by 0.5, okay? You don't do, you don't, you don't times by, a, a, you don't mark things up. You always use a divisor. And I'll explain to that, uh, why you do that in a later video. I'm just gonna uh, break down how I price stuff uh, for today. If I'm steady, you know, uh, I got enough work, but I could use a little bit more, uh, 0.55. If I'm not busy at all, then I do uh, 0.6. And I'll show you how that changes the prices here in a second. So, how do we determine um, the price for our projects? First, we got to add our labor in, right? So, that's based off my break even, my overhead, um, and what profit I want to make, right? So, that'll give you your labor rate. You know all those numbers. You can figure out, okay, how much do I need to make an hour on an install? Is it 60 bucks an hour, 70 bucks an hour, 80 bucks an hour? What is that number? That's going to be determined off knowing what your break even, your overhead, and then what percentage profit you want to make, okay? Uh, per hour you need to add your equipment in there add your parts add your permit add your subs any the you add any of these things that um, aren't a fixed cost like your overhead and everything these are going to change on each job so have a line item for that spreadsheets are real good for that i have a really good spreadsheet that i got from somebody that works awesome so let's say you add all that together and that turns into seven thousand dollars okay just for a round number so you know if i'm busy you know, it's going to basically be doubled, 14000 If I'm steady, you know, it'll be 12727 If I'm not busy at all and I want I want the work, you know, it'll be 11 and some change. So you can see the difference between the two. And, you know, you'll get, obviously you're going to get more work at this price than you would at this one. You'll lose out to some low, low ballers on this one. This one, you're going to be somewhere in the middle, but, um, that's, that's how I try to do it. Um, and it keeps me busy. My closing rate's good anyway. Most of my stuff's referral. So this, a lot of this just gets thrown out the window and I just start bidding stuff this all the time because I'm never really slow. So, uh, yeah, but take a look at all that. That's how I do it. You know, you guys might do it differently. But uh, it works for me. It works well. So, okay, guys. So yeah, that's just in closing. That's how I do. That's how I do my pricing on stuff, and uh, you know how I keep my business rolling. You know, obviously, I've been kind of sitting on my hands a little bit the last couple of weeks because I got some vehicle issues. But that's all built into my my break even throughout the year. So. Uh, you know, I can make it up, you know, I can, I honestly, I got a business model. I can take a month or two off if I really uh, wanted to. And, uh, I don't stress out about it. You know, I have customers, I have jobs out there. They're willing to wait for me. Uh, you know, we're heading towards the shoulder season and, uh, things aren't that, aren't that pressing. If things were really pressing, uh, you know, in, in the, in the middle of summer, I would, I would definitely, uh, you know, get a vehicle the next day somehow. I'd, I'd rent a truck or something if I had to, uh, you know, my plan is I, I have a truck that's up on top of my hill here that was supposed to be my backup, but I never got it fixed. So my part of my business model is always having a backup vehicle as a one man band. So uh, I'm probably, maybe I'll buy two vans. I'm, I'm working on that right now. I got I got something uh, lined up for next week to get me by. And then uh, I'm going to get the, the vehicle situation figured out. So all life is good. I got no I got no complaints. And uh, I just want to do a quick little video on this stuff for you, and, and uh, hopefully, hopefully you learned something if you didn't know this stuff already. And uh, you know, I'm happy to help uh, any any small one-man band businesses or larger businesses if need be. That's not really my forte, though. Uh, but I'm here. I'm here for you guys if you need something. I got vast experience. I've taken lots of classes on business and lots of classes on HVAC. So uh, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, guys. Okay, guys, let's go over this very uh, quickly and precisely. These are what your 24-volt uh, uh, low-voltage terminals and what colors I use. This is assuming a 10-stranded uh, 10, a 10 1810, uh, uh, sorry, an 1810 thermostat wire, okay? So it's a 18-gauge wire with 10 terminals in it, 10 different colors. So we got our 24 volts, which is our R, red. Our 24 volts common, C, which is blue. G, which is controls our fan, is green. Then you have your W1, which is your first stage of heat, white. W2, your second stage of heat is brown. Y1, your first stage of your compressor, your AC, yellow. Second stage compressor, Y2, I use pink. O for your reversing valve. Uh, 
I use orange. Now that can be O slash B. I should put that there because some uh, pieces of equipment use B for uh, energizing the, the reversing valve. That means it's energized in heating side. And then on your heat pump thermostats, you have auxiliary slash E. Sometimes they're separate on there too. That's basically just your um, either your backup heat or your defrost uh, when the system goes into uh, defrost uh, some way to temper uh, the temperature of the air. And then you have your outdoor sensor terminals, S1 and S2. I use black and gray. This is assuming an 1810 wire. So these are the colors that you'll have in your 1810 thermostat wire. These are the colors that I use and uh, I've been using them for probably about 25 years. So let's go over the uh, different scenarios that you will use these wires for uh, in a real life application on a job. Okay guys, single stage gas furnace with a single stage air conditioner. Okay, very basic. Red to red, that's your 24, 24 volts hot. Common to common, C. Uh, I already showed you what colors these would be. So blue, red, that's your 24, 24 volts common. G controls your fan, that's a green wire, G to G. W, W1, it's going to be W on a single stage unit, just uh, W to W, your white wire. Y to Y, yellow, so this is going from your thermostat to your gas furnace, real simple, real easy. And then from your gas furnace out to your single stage air conditioner, it's your, it's your single uh, first stage compressor wire, is what I call it, Y, yellow outside and then you'll do your blue which is your common outside that's all you do simple single stage gas furnace ac let's uh let's go over a uh two stage gas furnace ace uh two stage gas furnace with a two stage ac okay guys two stage gas furnace ac uh same as the uh single stage but now what you're adding is you're adding in your y2 uh, second stage compressor going outside so you're going to have that terminal on your thermostat and on your gas furnace and out to your air conditioner and I use pink for that uh, just just what I use some guys use brown but uh, I like to do it the same every time so Y2 for pink even some of the manufacturers have that as uh, the color inside of their equipment so easy to easy to mess it up if you don't do the same thing every time and then your W2 your brown wire uh, just goes from your thermostat to your furnace obviously because that's for your heat it's not going to go out to your AC so that's a quick uh, two-stage uh, gas furnace AC. Let's do a uh, single-stage uh, heat pump with a uh, sink, uh, one source of backup heat. Let me show you how that works. Okay, guys, single-stage heat pump with one stage of backup heat. Pretty similar to gas furnaces and ACs, but a little bit different. So you got R uh, from your thermostat to your um, air handling unit. Then R goes outside, except for the Bosch units that don't have an R that goes outside. So... Um, but most most heat pumps standard heat pumps are going to have your uh, red wire that needs to go outside your blue wire your common uh, Same same as uh, AC goes from your thermostat to your air handling unit to your heat pump G just goes from your uh, Thermostat to your air handler because it's just going to control the indoor fan Then you have I'm going to call it on a heat pump w1 auxiliary e they're usually all the same terminal uh, you'll just have to do uh, change the programming. That's your white wire that goes into your air handler wire nut it Sometimes there's, a, there's two wires there that need to um, to energize all of your banks of heat strips So sometimes you'll have to wire nut three wires together there and then your white wire continue outside I'm gonna call it defrost w1 for outside because it's gonna come on uh, during defrost. Okay Y1 same first stage compressor yellow uh, from the thermostat to the air handler and then from your uh, air handler to your outdoor unit and then O, and I should put O slash B here. So O, o slash B is going to be your orange wire, O slash B to O slash B. Now on some of the units like the Bosch, the Reams, you'll need to switch that in the thermostat to have it energized um, in heating, which would be your B. So, And then another thing that most heat pumps should have is a, a two-wire two outdoor sensor. Some of the Wi-Fi thermostats 
uh, are doing it via uh, the, the, you know, the closest weather station. So it'll get the weather data that way. I think this is the best way to do it. Find a suitable place on the house to put your outdoor sensor. It's just a two wire sensor. Again, I use black and gray for those. This is assuming a 10, a, a 10 wire uh, thermostat wire. Okay. And then, you know, find a shaded place to put that. You'll get the best data and it'll lock. <clears throat> That's used to lock out your backup heat. So let's say you only want the heat pump to run down to like freezing. And then you would have your auxiliary heat kick on below that temperature. Okay. Let's do a, let's do a four heat, two cool scenario on this. So I can show you the, the most uh, crazy setups that you'll see. Okay, guys, two stage heat pump with two stages of backup heat. So this is, I'm not going to go over all this and it's all the same RR all the way outside. Uh, common all the way to outside uh, fan from your uh, thermostat to your air handler doesn't go outside then you got what you have your auxiliary uh, your backup heat stage one um, out to your w1 outside uh, usually there's only going to be one outside uh, i've never seen a heat pump that has two of them and then auxiliary two so that would be uh, let's say your second stage of backup heat okay uh, you would tie that just indoor and then you would wire it out them all outside because you want to energize your whole bank of heat strips when it goes into defrost. Uh, I, I recommend it anyway. And another way you can do it too is you can have this um, these staged on, a, on an outdoor sensor as well. Uh, it just gets a little complicated that way. Usually a, a smart thermostat will have a, a, can do it timed. So, you know, if it doesn't reach temp within a certain amount of time on your backup, it'll kick in that second stage. So there's, there's programming in the thermostats that'll help you with that. Uh, first stage compressor outside, second stage of your compressor outside, and then your reversing valve again, and then your outdoor sensor. So I didn't want to get too crazy with uh, going over this too much, uh, it, you know, as opposed to what I showed you already because it's the same. But uh, this this stuff here is a little bit different. So how about a dual fuel? How would we set that up? Okay, guys. Instead of showing you the uh, wiring for these, I'm going to show you the difference because the wiring on a dual on a dual fuel, as opposed to a, a heat pump, are pretty pretty similar. So I'll be kind of going over things too much. So on a dual fuel system, it's going to be your gas furnace or your heat pump. They'll never run at the same time. They can't because what happens is your gas furnace will actually cause your heat pump to go out on high head pressure if you have the heat pump run at the same time. So you do the heat pump down to a certain temperature, then it switches over to your gas furnace, okay? How do, they, how do we determine where that switch over is? A couple different ways, okay? You have what's called your thermal balance point. Uh, you know, what, what's the most efficient method to heat the house at, at you know, what outdoor temperature? That can be determined by um, your uh balance points that you'll find uh, in the uh, manufacturer's data and then there's also an economic balance point too which um sorry i said that wrong thermal balance point is which which one will do it um the most comfortably okay so it's com it's a comfort balance point basically and then economic is what's the most efficient what's going to cost you the least to run okay so that can be found out by finding out what your utility utility data are ver, you know gas versus electric and there's a um, then you can punch in those numbers and uh, it'll tell you what your economic balance point is so but <clears throat> i'm just giving you guys terms that you can look up if you if you if you're not familiar with them so look up a thermal balance point just do a google search versus economic balance point and it'll explain all that to you i'm not going to get into it on my whiteboard here typically it's about 30 to 35 degrees is what most systems are set at but you know you can set them a lot lower or even higher depending on um, how the numbers come out okay heat pump with backup electric heat it's heat pump only above 35 degrees or whatever that um economic or thermal balance point is between heat pump and electric okay <clears throat> then what I, most systems between heat pump uh, most systems between 34 and 11 degrees are heat pump and the electric backup running at the same time. They can run at the same time because your electric heat strips are on the discharge side of your um, evaporator coil, so it's not going to affect the uh, the pressures as far as your refrigeration side of the system. Okay, so heat pump electric 34 to 11 degrees both at the same time, and then I like to set them up so it's electric only 10 degrees and below. Again, you can set up you can see what the thermal and economic balance points are on that too. To see, but most heat pumps are not going to run very well below 10 degrees uh, from what I've seen. So let me know if that makes sense to you guys. Uh, tried to just do a quick little video on wiring and kind of explain the difference between these systems for you real quick. I'm kind of in a hurry this morning. If you can't tell, I'm talking real fast. Uh, I got uh, I got stuff I got to go do today. So thanks for watching guys and uh, I will be back next week with actual ride-along videos for you. I'm looking forward to it. So I'll see you then.